Thank you, Brother Mike. Um, the Lord's blessed us today to have some wonderful folks to sing. Amen. Uh, Miss Deneva volunteered. We, I asked her to, but she said she would gladly do it. And then young Madison came to me and asked to sing that song, and that was very much a blessing. I do appreciate that. And especially her grandmother urging her to, to sing that song. Um, we need more of that. Um, we shouldn't be afraid. I know it's easy to get, it's scary to get up here and do anything, whether it's be singing in the choir or speaking or singing. But their own songs, uh, her song especially, when it said, uh, less of me and more of you, you know, putting myself at the cross and leaving it there. Self is not what it's about. It's about serving Him. And um, really, that's kind of what we're on tonight with our sermons is um, self. You know, it's um, surrendering all of yourself to God. Um, I want to talk a little bit about some things that are going on in my life the last couple of weeks, the last couple of months, really. Um, how many of you read the news, watch the news, read the newspaper, or look at circumstances around as far as our country and our, our, our society? Who in here is happy with what's going on in our society today, in our country? This country we call the United States that we're so proud of. And either the, I'm not talking about politics now, I'm talking about social and what we know is about we, we, this country we inherited and where it seems to be going today. How easy is it for us to look at those circumstances and get dejected and depressed and down? And we're Christians. We know where our eternity is secure, right? But it's so easy to see those things and get caught up in them. Get focused on them. Last couple months, I've been going through a little bit of that between the, everybody knows the daily to day to day grind of life in general. And then I was letting those things get up on my back and not reading like I should be on some of the scriptures necessarily, paying attention to what was going on in the news. And man, I didn't realize how much it had affected my attitude. Yeah how much I had let the world view and that world, the circumstances of what everybody else looks at affect my outlook on life. You know, it's one thing to be open eyes to what's going on in the world today. And we should as Christians understand and be conscious and knowledgeable about what's going on around us. But to be focused on it to the point that we're taking our eyes off of what God gives us. And then, I think I carried it one step further as if instead of trusting Christ, like I can do something about it without Him. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. As if, as if there's something I can do to either help my family or do this or change the circumstance. I have to double down on that department rather than just backing up and letting Christ handle it. Amen. You know? And that's sort of where we're going today. Let's start out, as you can see, with Matthew 6, 24 through 33. We're going to start there. We're going to probably try to go through... I'm going to try to go through quite a few Scriptures today, but uh, I'm going to let the Lord lead, and we'll stop where He leads me to stop. Let's start off with a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we just thank You for this day. We thank You for Your blessings today and for your the opportunity in this country, this great country, to have the freedom... To speak Your Word still, Lord. Lord, to speak it boldly. Not only here in this pulpit, but in our daily lives, Lord. We don't realize that that's not true in a large portion of the world that people can't freely speak out and spread Your Gospel, Lord. And we thank You for that. We pray that right here tonight that Your Holy Spirit would just be upon each one of us, that we would open our hearts and minds to Your message tonight and allow it to touch each one of us, Lord, including me tonight, Lord, that You would just be all over me tonight, Lord. Allow me just to, to be less and not, not me, Lord, and not be myself, but that it be Your Spirit through me speaking the words You would have to be said like tonight, Lord, and only those words. Lord, just uh, we love You and we praise Your name today, Lord, and we thank You. In Jesus' name we pray, Amen. Amen. All right, 6.24, and we're going to try to read to verse, we're going to read to verse 33. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. 
You cannot serve God and mammon. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life. What shall you eat, or what shall you, you shall drink? Nor yet for your body, what shall you put on? It is not the life, is not the life more than meat, and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit to his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you, that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you? O ye of little faith, take no thought. Say that again. Take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. Amen. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His, His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Amen. Now, I think I had sold him to quit at 33. We're going to read 34 also. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. I want you to notice a couple of things. I, I started reading the scripture and then I started digging into the scripture more and more. And, you know, I've read this before. We've, we've all read this before. And you, you want to you say, well, he, he means focus on God first. He don't actually mean don't think about it. We want to say that. You read into it and you kind of want to say, well, you, that's not what he really means. But he says the words, I'll go back into it and look at it, take no thought. Amen. Three? Three, four times, three times in there? And he says it consistently all throughout. We're not supposed to worry about the things of this world. Right. At all. At all. Does that mean we're supposed to think about next week, next month, next year? I'm not saying we aren't supposed to be good stewards. I know He teaches us to be good stewards of what He gives us. But worry. Right. And that taking that take no thought, that's that idea of worry. Mm -hmm. Worrying about the future. Worry, worry, worry. You look at those today's society, like I was saying, we just look at circumstances and we want to worry about things. If we're doing what He says here, that last part, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Yeah. Right. If we're doing that, it's all going to fall in place. Because we're going to be seeking His will first in our life. Seek His will. Seek His kingdom, not just His will. What does His kingdom include? What is His kingdom on this earth? Is it this church building? Is it that church building we just were building out there? Is that His kingdom? It's, it ha I'm sorry. It has nothing to do with it has not a thing to do with it because it's not the kingdom. I'm not talking about the material goods. I'm talking about each Christian, each believer, each soul that's brought into the state. That church will help us reach people, but it ain't His kingdom. His kingdom is the believers that walk in the doors. His kingdom is the believers that walk in the doors. Who do we reach for Him? How do we reach them? How can we reach His kingdom if we're sitting there going around, oh my Lord, the sky is falling and our country's coming to an end? Believers do that, don't they? I mean, non-believers do that, don't they? Amen. You can turn on talk radio all day long and hear about how whoa, 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 whoa is our country right now, can't you? Do you hear somebody on there really much talking about great is our God? No. Hmm? No. No, we don't. Turn the channel sometimes if you can find a good you can find a good station once in a while with somebody preaching some real gospel, but it's not as, as common as it used to be. And you know why that is? We let people tell us that offends me. We hold our tongue a little bit. We don't want to hurt somebody's feelings. 
I serve a God who tells me, we, we, we go over this over again. He says, if ye deny me before men, I'm going to deny ye before my Father which is in heaven. Yeah. He died on the cross for our sins. He died on the cross for our sins. He's provided the way for each one of us. Unsaved people, if you're here tonight and you're unsaved, you don't know what I'm talking about, let me tell you what. You're in, you're, you are in such a great opportunity right now because you have the same opportunity we do. Christ will save you today. Amen. And He'll give you the hope that we're talking about right now. Because that's how I get through the day. Amen. With hope. If you don't have hope in life, you've got nothing. You can turn to your scriptures and just open this Bible up and the hope is all throughout the scriptures. That redemption story of Jesus Christ is what this Bible is about. And you can find it in every part of it if you look. It says, Ye cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon. Material things. Seeking the things of this world. That's not saying material things can't be part of your life. You're not supposed to seek them out. You're supposed to seek what? What's the last verse say? Seek ye first the kingdom. So if you find yourself seeking material things first or without the, you know, the filter of Jesus Christ, without it being His will, that you do this action on a day-to-day -day basis, what's the point? And I mean, I meant to bring up a part earlier. We, we, many times we want to talk about, <sighs> there used to be, and when I was a young man, they had a, a, a thing where they called radical Christianity. You know, and back a little older, it was fanatical, fanatics for Christ. Nowadays, they use uh, the terminology all in. How many of y'all young folks heard the term all in? You know, how can you be a part-time Christian? Okay. Seriously. How can you be a part-time Christian? That's what this here is talking about. You can't serve the two masters. You can't be a Christian part-time. Not really. You can't live the Christian life part-time. You're either all the way in or not. Because you're going to end up hating one and loving the other. That's what it says. You find yourself not wanting to come to church... Not wanting to pick your Bible up, not wanting to read. You find yourself like I just described earlier. You're down in the dumps and you're looking at the circumstances of the world. You got a problem. You've got a heart problem. Where is your heart? Who are you serving? What are your actions showing? Take no thought for your life. What you shall eat or what you shall drink. Take no thought. I'm going to go on one more. Is not the life, now I, I did this part for you, is not life, the life, the life God gives us, that abundant life that we are supposed to live, is that in the food, the drink, the clothes, the material items? Is our life that we're directed to live as Christians supposed to really have anything to do with enjoying these material things in this world? It's not. And Lord help me, y'all. But He wants us to live. He wanted our disciples to live like it was the very last day. You know, His disciples, when He told them, that preacher this morning, the original scriptures I had, He preached the scripture and He preached all over the top of it. And it was on the same kind of topic because Christ preached to the men at the Mount of Olives about the end times. But he didn't preach it in a sense of that's a foreboding. He preached it as a sense for them to be ready for it all the time. That ever vigilant, that living for me in a way. It was not a sense of this is the end, be scared. We as Christians have nothing to fear. Not fear. I'm not saying we're not going to suffer. I'm not saying fear is different. We've got an eternity in heaven secure. We know where we're going to go. We know that He's going to be faithful. He promises that to us. 
100%. He says it over and over and over again in the Scriptures and He's never failed. Amen. Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not. We're on verse 26. Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not. Neither do they reap, nor gather in the barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. God takes care of us. He takes care of the animals. He takes care of the smallest matter, smallest thing in His creation. The sparrows, everything has a point. The smallest thing. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you, here's the here's a really good part, by taking thought can add one cubit unto his stature. What can you do by worrying about it? Especially when you take that worry and you're out of God's will. Because when you're out of God's will, what are you not going to get? You're not going to get His blessing. Nope. Not even in consideration of it. So what's your worry going to be? Fruitless. He's, he's not going to abandon you, but your worry has nothing to do with the outcome. Not the first thing. Wasted energy. So don't do it. It's, it's useless. Why do it? What are you saying right here? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow and toll not, and neither do they spin. I'm going to scoot on down just a little bit. He even, he, this, this is where I really like this part because his attitude. He goes, oh ye, a little faith. Let's scoot on down. That's right there at the end of verse 30. He speaks to us. Says, oh ye, a little faith. You're worried about this stuff and you ain't got no faith. Come on. You've been with me how long? You got no faith. Guys, we've been Christians how long? Some of us? 47 years. I got 35 plus. Guys, and I still do it. You know why? You take your eyes off of Him. Mm -hmm. It's a daily walk. 30, 47 years, 35 years, it don't matter how long you've been a Christian, what do you got to do when you wake up in the morning? The same thing the brand new Christians have to do. A new young person here gets saved. We had two of them last week, by the way, thank God. Two young folks got saved at the, the movie show the other night. That person, young person, has to do the same thing the next morning that I got to do every day. They've got to wake up in the morning and look to Jesus. When you take your eyes off Him, you don't lose your salvation, but you're walking in that wrong direction. You're walking in that wrong direction. And that's what I'm learning every day. It's a new day. Trials and troubles, I bring on myself. Why? Because I take my eyes off of Christ. Amen. Take my eyes off of Christ. You bring it on yourself. This all this the last several months of trials and troubles and worry and, and things and down depressed, I brought on myself. Had nothing to do with reality. Because my reality as a Christian is what? It is not what we see before us in this world. It has nothing to do with whoever's in the White House doing whatever they do. It has nothing to do with that because my reality in this world is what God tells me to do today. And as long as I'm following what He tells me to do today, He promises me what? He's going to take care of me. Amen. All right. Again, there, in verse 31, Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat? Lord, y'all, y'all know that touches my heart. Come on now. What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or wherewithal all shall we clothed? I'm not as much worried about clothing, but Lord asked me if I'm going to miss a meal. <laughs> okay? I think about that next meal the day before. <laughs> yeah, Miss Bobby had it right. Well, I'm eating this one. Oh, and I'm, I am. Y'all pray for me because I am struggling with my weight. I'm trying to, I am really trying to, to, to do the right things in that. For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, what makes us different than them? What makes them different than us? If we're doing the same thing they're doing, how are we showing them a difference? As the pastor had in one of his verses this morning, the, the evangelist had in one of his verses this morning, a peculiar people. A people that's called out to be different. We're not called to be the same as the world. 
Guys, we're not called to put on a show in this church to draw the world into the show that they could go down to the theater and get. We're called to show them Jesus Christ. Amen. Period. Period. What is that form does that take? That's what he shows you to do. What does he show you to do? It's in this scripture right here. You're doing something outside the scripture. You're not in the right place. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. His righteousness. We preach, for the buddy has preached and preached and preached on it's not our righteousness. I saw a really, talking about the internet and Facebook and all that stuff, but I saw a really great video today. And I can describe a little bit to you, but it was, it was awesome in the way that they showed it because many of you, if you watch my Facebook wall, you'll see it. But they were getting on a scale, it was the good meter. And people come up there with their file, what they did, and what they did, and what they did. And they'd hand their file in, and they'd get on the scale, and boom, it'd be bad. Then the last one, of course, comes up, and he hands his file, and he holds it out. And Jesus steps up and says, throw that one away and take this one. You're using mine for this guy. And then not only does Jesus do that, but he steps on the scale. Because it ain't us. Amen. Has not a thing to do with us. Has none, nothing. We accepted him, and then his righteousness completely applies over our life. Yeah. Now all we've got to do is follow him. You know, follow him. We're a child of his. He's not going to leave us alone. He says, I don't have the exact scripture, but I, he is faithful to complete the work he started. Now, I can't remember the exact scripture, but many of you probably could quote it for me. He's faithful to complete the work he starts. He doesn't start something he doesn't finish. Amen. Period. Period. <laughs> Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. All these things. These things being what? All these things. What are we talking about? You seek the kingdom of God first. All the things you were worried about, you ain't got to worry about, do you? Yeah. He doesn't say you're going to be rich. He's going to provide for you what you need. If He needs you in His work to be rich, you may be rich. But you better not let it get to your head and start thinking about the riches rather than Him. Because you'll run it into the ground as soon as you take control of it. It's that simple. Let him stay at the lead of your life and he will bless you. And you may be the poorest man in town, but you're going to be where God wants you to be and be the happiest person around. It's that simple. I'm going to go to another verse real quick. Joshua, Joshua 24. We're going to do three verses in Joshua 24. Because we've got a choice. In Joshua uh, 24, he, he, Josh is talking to the people of Israel. They just got into the promised land. And they've got a choice to make because when they came out of Egypt, they brought some stuff with them. What'd they bring? Some of that old gold and silver, those old idols. Remember, they kind of looted Egypt as they left, right? So they brought some of that stuff with them. They brought them old gods. Egypt was known to have a lot of old gods. Ah, yep, yeah, good. And I have given you a land for which ye did not labor, and cities which ye built not, and ye dwell in them of the vineyards and olive yards which ye planted not, do ye eat. Right here. Of, of this generation that's alive right now, how many of us Really, really, really. How many of us have paid the price? There's some of these men here that went to war. But there's fewer in this generation than there has been in the past. We haven't faced a world war. It's the price hasn't been as dear in the near, in the near past as it was in the distant past, is what I'm trying to say. To some of this generation, they haven't felt the pain and paid the price. These people here didn't have to do and build 
what they had. That's all I'm meaning. I know the prices. I'm not belittling the price our soldiers have paid. I'm just talking about there's so much in our life that we didn't deserve. We haven't built up that we're reaping the rewards of a nation that was built before us. 200 years ago, much of the foundation was laid plus 200 plus years ago. And we are able through God's grace to reap those rewards. And yet, our society constantly seeks other gods. People fight harder than a lot of Christians to eliminate Christianity, to eliminate Christ, to bar us from speaking out in our schools. You watch things happen where these other religions seek preeminence and seek their rights, and yet we're still not allowed to do or we're not still allowed. We're forbidden because we might offend them. And the reason that happens, why? So many times because we don't jump up and say, we have the right to speak. We don't have to be rude. We don't have to curse. We don't have to lose our Christian testimony to stand strong for the right to speak out on Christ's behalf. Period. I had... A conversation the other day with someone, and they were admonishing me because I was getting passionate. Passionate. In other words, vocal. I wasn't cursing, but they were like, just, just calm down. It was a good topic, it was a Christian topic. I don't remember the exact topic. But I, I spoke to that person. I said, wait a minute. Exactly what you're having a problem with is why we have the problem we have in the United States today. Because Christians are sometimes afraid that if they speak up, they're right, and they fight for their rights, that they're not going to be viewed as being a Christian. As if it's wrong because we're a Christian to be slightly, um, I hate to use the wrong, I don't know if it's the right word or not, but aggressive. Assertive, thank you. Assertive for our rights. To stand up for Jesus Christ is what the Bible say? Those who deny me before men, him will I deny before my Father in heaven. Right. If you're given a place and an opportunity to speak up and stand for your right, as to, to me, as a Christian, it's your obligation, your duty to Jesus Christ to assert yourself. Amen. We need to stand up for Jesus, and not for our rights, but for our right to proclaim Him. Period. Everywhere we can. And we need to, so many times we want to caution, we don't have that many young folks in here, so I'm not, I'm not stepping on too many toes here, but we want to caution our young folks not to do certain things in school. They don't want to, we don't want to, we don't want to stir up waves or whatever, guys, but parents, I want you to really investigate that. You can do what you want with your children, but you need to really it's worthwhile learning what the right is because if your child don't learn what their rights are now in school, as they go through life, they're going to assume the rest of their life is the same way. Right. And so many times they're given false information in school. Some teacher says you can't do that when that's not the truth. They, you, they, don't, they don't want you to do that, but you have the right to do certain things and you need to know what your rights are. Okay, I'm off that soapbox. Now, we're on verse 14. Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve Him in sincerity and in truth. And put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt and serve ye the Lord. And then here's the really big part. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And that's what I'm talking about here. And the individual, this is not Joshua as the, he was speaking as a leader. But in that sentence, he's not speaking as a leader. He's speaking as the leader of his house. We need men to be men. And lead. In every aspect of their home. To stand up. To make standards. 
to do the, 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 the mental forethought and, the, and, the, and the, the, the sweat that it takes sometimes to study out and know for theirself what they believe. If you come to church to be fed, that's fine. But if you're not doing your own studies and learning for yourself what you believe, the Bible says, go ye, not go the preacher, not go somebody who's, you know, some like me or one of these young ministers around here who's seeking a call and who's called to be a minister. It says, go ye, speaking to every believer, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. Does that say go ye into all the world and teach the gospel? So many people are scared of that word preach. And I'm telling you right now, it says preach the gospel. <coughs> Every believer is commanded to preach the gospel. I don't, it doesn't have to be from the pulpit. That's, a, that's, that's, a, that's a, a privilege. But when you have the opportunity to look somebody else in the eye and tell them the gospel, that's in your commandment. And that's in your obligation. And every time you fail at it, every time you fail at it, I fail at it, we're going to be called accountable. We're going to be called accountable. If we cannot speak and understand clearly the message of salvation, how can we tell somebody else what the message of salvation is? If you know, I got saved, okay? It's great that you got saved. That's fantastic. I'm glad you got saved. Now, you've been saved 10 years. Can you tell someone else how to get saved? I'm not asking for hands. I'm serious, though. I'm dead serious. Can you speak to someone else and explain to them clearly and concisely what it takes to be saved? It's not a complicated... We say it all the time. It's not complicated. It's simple. It's not easy. But it's simple. It's not easy to turn your life over to Him and surrender. That's the hard part. But it is not complicated. You know you're a sinner. You trust Jesus Christ for your salvation and ask Him in your heart. You're, you're done, guys. You know, He commands us to proclaim Him, to profess Him. But you've made those first actions. You're going to go out and do the rest. Right? Right. All right. I hope I'm not taking up too much time. Christian here today, we've got a choice to make. Not I was talking about unsaved, but Christians here today, we've got a choice to make too. We can serve the two masters. Can you serve two masters? We already said it. You've got to choose the one or the other. Wholeheartedly. Not halfway. Not a little, not, not, you know, 90-10. Guys, that little bit that you keep holding in reserve, it's got to get. We all have to do it. There's a saying that says, if the world has yet to see a man totally sold out for Christ and what he can do. I can't remember exactly how that one's worded either. I remember these partial sayings. But it's the whole principle of the matter is, God, the world has not seen a human being, one man that, other than Jesus Christ, who was 100% sold out. 100% sold out. Every time anybody I know says they, they, were, they thought they were 100% sold out, God keeps finding more areas to reveal to us, right? All right. Unsaved person, you've got a choice tonight also. Give up everything in this world's got. It's uncertainty, the evil. <laughs> so many things about this world are so scary. And we offer to you today a certainty, an eternal certainty, a knowing where you're going, a knowing that what we talked about here, that certainty of knowing where you, that Jesus Christ is going to be there for you. There's a hole in your heart right now that you don't know how to fill. And Jesus says, I'm, I'm going to go real quick through it. He says, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. We're talking about Jesus Christ. He died on the cross. He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever, anybody, whosoever believeth on Him should not perish, but have eternal life. You don't have to die and go to hell. You don't have to live this life. Hell's a little bit, hell's an eternity, but hell's, hell's tomorrow. You don't got to live this life alone. Right. Period. My wife's been going through a real tough time lately. She lost her father. 
Sometimes she tells me she feels so alone because that was her daddy. He was her phone call. When me and her have a problem, it was daddy. And that's tough. Because now who does she call? She didn't talk to mama like that. She talked to daddy. So this is a big adjustment for her. She knows Christ is her Savior, and we go, keep going back to that. But that's still a big adjustment. But you don't have to be alone, ever. That's right. My wife has that. She has a thing, a place that she can go to talk to. And Jesus will give her the answers. He gives me the answers. Each one of the saved people in here, He gives the answers that you need. Romans 3.10 says, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now, I'm saying these two verses for this, any unsaved person here that thinks there's any way that they can do enough. That there's something that they can do that can help them earn their way in heaven. There is none righteous, no, not one. And all have sinned. There ain't nobody in here that's kept all the commandments and lived a perfect life. You know, um, if you say you are, I'm going to call you on it because you're going, you just made one of them that's going to lie. Okay? It's that simple. And then I'll take you back to another part where it says, well, I don't, we're not, we're not, um, we don't sin. No, I can't. I can't do it. I can't. Get, I never can get that saying right. It's basically the fact that we don't sin just because we're, we have that carnal nature inside of us. Carnal nature was passed down by Adam. Adam sinned, and his sin is passed on to us. We're condemned from that sin. We already have a carnal, evil nature inside of us. Romans five eight says, "But God commendeth His love toward us." In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. If that doesn't just jolt you, I'm sorry, you ain't alive. Because while we were in the depth of our worst place in our life, Christ had already paid the price. Amen. Period. The worst thoughts we've ever had the worst deeds we've ever done, He knew about when He laid on that tree. He knew about your deeds. That happened 2,000 years ago, but my God is an eternal God. And He knew about your worst sins when He laid on that tree. And He still did it. He still did it. Now Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. You don't have to live out your price. He paid it. And the way you get that is Romans 10, 9 and 10. But if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him to the dead, thou shalt be saved. It's that simple. Confess in your mouth and believe in your heart. All right? I'm going to skip down to a verse, John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, if we do what we just talked about, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. As Christians, we've all done that. As an unsaved person, if you're here and you haven't done that, then you don't know what we're talking about. When you can have that assurity in your heart and you can know that you can know that you can know. You're going to heaven. You can have that daily walking relationship with Him to where when you do take your eyes off those circumstances and you look to Jesus Christ on the cross, you know, when you're not looking at Him, that's your fault. But if you look to Him for your problems to help and you praise His name, you'll be surprised at the joy He brings in your life. He says He inhabits the praises of His people. Sometimes we don't think about that enough because we're so down and we're so upset. It's so hard when you're sitting there and you're, Lord, I don't know what to do. Lord, okay, I'll give you a clue, guys. I don't care how bad you feel. 
Amazing grace. Sing that a little bit. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Singing that does not bring, if it does not bring a chill to your back, and you're a Christian, you want to look inside your heart a little bit. Sing it some more. There's plenty of joyful, faster beat songs if that's your thing. Sing that. There's a song, a Christian hymn song somewhere, singing praise of Jesus Christ. He will inhabit the praise of His people. And He'll bring joy. Amen. Right. Non-Christian, we talked about it. Giving your heart to Christ, what do you gain? You gain Christ and you gain eternity. Christian, following Him on a daily, gain, daily walk, what do you have to give up? That old carnal self? Some of the things you might have had your eyes set on in the past? Philippians 3, 7 through 10. Philippians 3, 7 through 10. Paul says, But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. What you were looking at, you're going to count them as loss. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of, Jesus, of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things and do count them but done, that I may win Christ. In winning Christ, you win. We talked about it back there in that Matthew where it says, all these things shall be added unto you. You get what you need. Maybe not what you were dreaming of or thinking of in the past, but he takes care. And if you really thought you had anything before you gave it up, it's Satan's lie. Christian, if you think that you can hold on to something that you're trying to hold on to that you're not willing to give up for Christ because it's just that little area that you think you got. You don't have it and you're not getting the blessing that you would have. You're losing out twice because it's just keeping you from God's blessing. And be found in Him, that I, okay, the end of verse 9, that I may win Christ, verse 9, and be found in Him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings, being made conformable unto His death. In your Christian walk, in our Christian walk, we are going to face troubles. Right. We face them all the time. I've just talked about some things going in the past couple of weeks for me. Troubles and trials. Some of those troubles and trials weren't of my making. Because I didn't have my eyes like where I should have had them. I was facing a lot of that underneath my own strength. I wasn't looking for Him. I suffered a little, a lot more than what I should have suffered. Amen. And if I'd have had my eyes on Him, this verse right here says, the power of His resurrection, the fellowship of His sufferings. So as we go through it, He's there with us. Amen. What did He go through when He was here? What kind of torture and persecution that He went through? Come on now. Did He... He knows what we go through. He suffered it. He's been there. And He's right by your side holding your hand and sometimes carrying you along if you're looking for Him. Because if you look to Him, you, 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 you go through some things and you won't even blink. Come on now. You'll be walking through something and everybody around you is going, how? And you're just... Cruising right along because that particular time you're looking to Him and you're living in the power of Jesus Christ. Amen. And you don't even... Uh, you notice what's going on, but it doesn't feel like it's the 
what everybody else sees. Because you are looking to Him. You're not worried about that stuff. Jesus Christ gives you the power through Him. Not in you, but through Him. I've got two more verses and I'm going to call it a day. James 4. James 4. <laughs> Go to now, ye that say, today or tomorrow. James 4, 13. Where we're at, I'm sorry. James 4, 13. Go to now, ye that say, today or tomorrow, we will go into a city, such a city, and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It's a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanisheth away. For that ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now ye rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. There for him that knoweth to do good and doeth not it not to him it is sin. We talked a little bit about that scripture the pastor read this morning when he talked about the end times. It was Matthew 14, I believe. The end of the world's coming, right? He spoke that to his disciples 2,000 years ago. We should be living today in that same mode. We know our life's a vapor. There's a moment. We're here but a moment. If we're the youngest one in here is probably eight, nine years old maybe. And the, I don't know, I'm not going to ask who the oldest one is. But even that span of difference of years is just a blink to Jesus Christ. In the, in the scheme of where we've come from 2,000 years ago to now, that's just a tiny hair breath. Jesus told His disciples as if it could be tomorrow. And we should be acting even more now because we know the prophecies. I, I spoke a little with Brother Mike earlier today just about, and I, I didn't even understand some of what he was talking about. The pastor brought out the blood moon thing this morning. And if you have a chance to study that, that sounded really interesting talking with Brother Mike. I, I would love to have some more talk about that. But the, the prophecies in talking about those things and how close we are to the end times. And that for all intents and purposes, most everything that needs to be occurred to occur has occurred. And it should happen, should happen based on prophecy in this generation. I've been told that my whole life, guys. My mom was born in 1947. One of the prophecies that I've been taught, and I'm not a prophetic minister here, so I'm not going to sit there and try to do it, but was that the budding of the fig tree represented Israel becoming a nation. And that... In the scripture that passed right this morning, that was said that the, this generation shall not pass away once that's happened. Israel became a nation in 1948. And that's my mom's generation. She was a 47. How much closer can you get? My mom's 67 years old. This last Friday. I think I got that right. <laughs> um... It ain't, it ain't far. It's not far. All right, last one. We'll, we'll go on and I'll, I'll call, it a, call it a night. 1 John 2.15. 1 John 2.15, if you want to turn there. This is the real crux of the whole thing. 2.15. I love hearing those pages turn. I don't mind waiting a minute for those pages to turn. I know the Scripture's right behind me, but I want people to have that paper Bible. I'm reading off a piece of paper for convenience, but I, I've already looked them up, and I've got my Bible right here, and I love to hear people using these Bibles nowadays. I know a lot of this new generation uses phones and stuff, and I do have one, but it's in church. I love to hear the pages of the turn. 1 John 2.15 Love not the world, Neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. 
The world passeth away and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. People, we've got to love God. We can't serve two masters. You can't love the world. You can't love the things of the flesh and the carnal self. And you can't straddle the fence and have something holding you back. The end of the world is here. I'm, I can't say that anymore. The end of the world is here. Times are bad. We can look at all that. But we as Christians have a promise no matter what. And we have an obligation no matter what. To spread the gospel. To tell people that no matter whether the end of the world is here or not, there's hope. Because, guys, if it happens tonight, I'll be in heaven. And I'll be rejoicing. Period. And I'll be glad to go. I love y'all and I love, honestly, I love the ministry. I love doing what we do around here. But Lord, help me. When He calls my name, I am going to be jumping just as hard as I can jump. You know, if I can propel myself a little faster, I'm going to do it. I am ready to go. Life is a struggle. That doesn't mean it's, he's not. I don't know what it's going to hold in the, in the hereafter. But I know I'm going to be with him. You know, after that, I'm all with him. This old, I don't got to, after that, I ain't going to have to worry about losing the weight, guys. <laughs> he's going to fix that for me. You know, he knows where my heart is. He's going to fix that. We've got to determine and surrender those things, those little areas. Right now is the time to get serious about God. Right now is the time to determine for you and your family, man or woman here. Some, there's some single woman here. You've got a job. From the oldest, I don't, I'm not saying you're the oldest, but from the, from, from the oldest to the youngest. Male or female, if you are the only person in your household and you're an older woman, you've got a job to do, Miss Nancy. God has a calling on you and a ministry for you to do. And with every ounce of your ability, and go all the way down to the youngest one in here, whether it be probably Jeremiah. <laughs> but probably Jeremiah. God's got a calling on Jeremiah. And he's got something from Jeremiah as a 10-year-old? Huh? 11-year-old. As an 11-year-old to do. Jeremiah has a ministry. He has something that God, God has something that he, it, he wants him to do. A calling for Jeremiah today, tonight, tomorrow morning. A plan that he wants Jeremiah to follow. Jeremiah is, no, is not insignificant. Every one of us need to make this choice tonight, tomorrow morning, and every day in part of our walk. Choose to follow Christ. Choose to stand your ground. Choose to live for Him in a fanatical, radical Christian way. Amen. Stop settling for halfway. For mediocre. Live the way God wants you to live. He says, I have come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Live it out. Live it out. Give it all you got. Because you might not have much left. And that person you missed Friday talking to, if you see them tomorrow, talk to them. I don't care if it costs you your job. I don't. If it gets a word in their ear for Christ, and you have that opportunity, you need to do it. Amen. You need to do it. It's that simple. Let's close in a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we love You, Father, and we thank You. Lord, um, tonight Your Word has been preached. And I'm, I'm just awed that You would use me tonight, Lord. I pray, Father, for the folks here, Lord, the decisions that they have and we have to make, Lord, to follow You. Father, I pray that You would just move on the hearts of those here tonight, Lord, and touch them in such a way, Lord, if there's a single one here not saved, Lord, 
that they would just uh, surrender to You right now, Lord. Lord, they can come up here and bow before these altars right now and seek Your will right here, Lord. Lord, I know there's these de the deacons here tonight, Lord, would gladly show them how to, 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 to know You, Lord, and I would talk to them too. But Lord, I pray for also the Christians here tonight, each one of us, me and all of us, that we would go out of here in such a radical manner and live for You, Lord. Live for You today, tomorrow, as if and as it is the last day of our lives, the last day on this planet. Lord, I just pray for tonight for the, uh, the birthday fellowship tonight, Lord. I pray You would bless that fellowship tonight, Lord. Bless that food that may nourish us tonight. Lord, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I want to have a song real quick. I think, Brother Mike, you have one song? I thought you were in it, so I was just fixing to read the announcement. For the, uh, Let's do one song real quick. One song. One song, one verse. Let's do Amazing Grace. We don't even need music. We can just sing it. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I found. Was blind, but now I see. All right. All right. We'll rest it real quick. Can we sing just a